What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? And welcome inside to yet another installment of Open Run presented by War Media as we're recording this at the top of the week on the eve of the NBA Finals. I'm your host, Gabriel Wilkins, and I'm joined per usual beside my co-host and running mate, Josh Hicks, to discuss the many series of events that have transpired the last several days and beyond across the hoops landscape. How's everything going, my man? Busy but good, man. I hope you had a good holiday weekend and got some good barbecue in your you spent some quality time with the family and everything. Um, and obviously, back on the mic, which was always a pleasure. I'm always, always ready to get things rolling whenever we talk about all, all things basketball, you know? Oh, yes, indeed. And I definitely had a great Memorial Day weekend. I can't complain. I was out of town, came back into town and, you know, kicked it with family a little bit, got out to some baseball games and just was chilling. But in this week's edition of Open Run, me and Josh will closely recap and examine the up and down roller coaster ride of a seven game series that took place in the Eastern Conference Finals between the Miami Heat and Boston Celtics with an ending that may have caught most by surprise while also taking some time to discuss the future of Lonzo Ball, what it means for the Chicago Bulls, and so much more. However, prior to us getting into all of the trending topics to surface across the radar over the last week, let's take some time, as we always do, to tip off open run, saluting the top performers in the game during that time as part of our Hoop Shoutout segment. Special Hoop Shoutouts this week go out to Miami Heat forward Caleb Martin, who's 135 total points scored in the conference final round against the Celtics, helped him to surpass former Knicks guard John Starks in the 1994 NBA Finals for the most points in a conference or NBA Finals series by an undrafted player in the modern draft era, which goes all the way back to the 1966-67 season as the former Nevada standout dropped 26 points on 11 for 16 shooting from the field to go with 10 rebounds in game seven to help Miami move on and advance to their second NBA finals in the last four seasons, including another player and local product who managed to go undrafted and caught on with the Miami Heat after signing a training camp contract just three seasons ago by the name of Max Schroes. The former DePaul product will be the lone player representing the state of Illinois in this year's NBA Finals, which will mark the 22nd consecutive time that at least one of the teams to reach the championship stage will include someone who played high school hoops in the land of Lincoln. So after taking a brief moment to shout out a pair of players who are set to appear on the NBA Finals bill in the coming days, what are some storylines or matters across the basketball world that have stood out to you the most over the last week, Josh. Oh man, um, obviously there's a lot of basketball stuff going on, but, but the, my main two people, the main you highlighted the main ones I was going to highlight: Caleb Martin and Max Struess. Um, And if you want to be real technical, we can add in there Gabe Vincent, Gabe Vincent, and Duncan Robinson. These are all guys that undrafted, making a huge impact on a Miami Heat team that led to the Eastern Conference Finals. Obviously, we know, you know, uh, Caleb Martin is pick up Easter Conference Finals performance could have literally been the Easter Conference Finals MVP, honestly. And I believe um, from a report that I saw, he's one vote away from he was one vote away from becoming the MVP. He was Butler beat him five to four. It was yeah. real close. He had he yeah. had some support from the media for sure, for sure. But Caleb Martin, he he definitely. Represent the underdogs and what's the best way to represent the underdog in an environment that was led by Pat Riley. I mean, what is what can you say about that? And obviously, you know, I gotta give a shout out to my DePaulian brother, our DePaulian brother, <laughs> and Max Struess, um, for all the work that he did. But I'm gonna highlight Pat Riley in this one too. And this is why Pat Riley is heading to his 19th NBA finals as either a player, assistant coach, or an executive. That is, if you round the numbers, 25% of all NBA finals. So all NBA finals, out of all the NBA finals you've seen, I forgot how many there are now, but out of all the NBA finals that are there, 25% of them, a fourth of them, have Pat Riley in them. If you ain't talking about GOAT legendary status with the slick, smooth, white, silky hair dude, man, I don't know what to tell you. Um, It's just a testament to his greatness and not just seeing talent, coaching talent, playing with talent, 
but developing talent, which is what Miami is known for. And having four undrafted players play in the NBA Finals and play pivotal roles with Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo to get the job done and winning the Eastern Conference Finals against the best of the best, you got to tip your hat off to what Miami has done, obviously, but for sure, specifically, Pat Riley and what he's done, and not just developing those players, but even developing Eric Spolstra. This dude was not meant to be a coach in this league, if you really think about the trajectory of where he was going. And Pat Riley made him his replacement, carried the torch from after winning a championship, uh, bringing Miami his first championship with D-Wade and Shaq. And then you bring LeBron in town with Bosh, and now he's gone to overall, I think, seven finals, seven, eight finals now since he's been a coach in Miami. That's impressive, man. Um, and those and Miami has I, I don't know, I gave a whole bunch of random people on there. So I'm just gonna give a whole Miami shout out. But um, yeah, it's it Miami's culture and what they've done to develop what they have now, and for all these years previous leading up to this, it's a testament to what it really means to invest in your players, invest in your coaching staff, invest in your team as a whole. And that's the blueprint to success. Yeah, I mean, that, that's well said and well spoken on, Josh. I, I can't help but give Miami credit. There have been so many times over the last couple of years where in spite of the greatness of Pat Riley, things have always seemed to be fluttering on the edge a little bit. Like, how in the hell are they going to make this work with Kyle Lowry, an mm-hmm. agent point guard who's on a very expensive contract? But, you know, so many times we was asking ourselves, how they going to find a way to get that off the books? Yet in these playoffs, Cal Lowry, albeit off the bench, played a very vital role in helping the Heat get to the NBA Finals for the second time in four years. You add that on top of the Don and Pat Riley himself, who oftentimes appears to be on the back nine of his career these days, still finding a way to make the most with his pieces when you least expect them to. You talk about Gabe Vincent, Duncan Robinson, Kayla Martin, who's averaging 19.3 points, 6.4 rebounds on 60.2% shooting from the floor and 48.9% shooting from beyond the arc. Those were his numbers against the Celtics in the conference finals. What do these guys all have in common, as you alluded to? Undrafted. You go back to his days with the Knicks where he was able to find an undrafted guard by the name of John Starks, who he had a dominant run with in the early 90s beside Patrick Ewing, and then a forward in Anthony Mason, who was also undrafted, rest in peace. And it's like this guy continues to find talent. And that's a testament to him and his scouting department and the personnel in Miami is who, as much as I hate to use that word, is a word that they've come to coin and define is their culture. And they making it work in in everything, man. And I got to give them a a lot of respect, man, because it ain't every day you see a number eight seed get to the finals. And no disrespect to the 99 Knicks who did that, but that was during a lockout year. They did this within a full season. And there were so many times where you wondered whether or not they were going to even make it in as the eighth seed, Mm -hmm. losing to the Hawks in the play-in round being within minutes away of losing the AFC against the Bulls in a winner go home scenario during the play-in tournament. Find a way to beat the best team in the Eastern Conference with the best record in all of basketball during the regular season, the Milwaukee Bucks. Then you have Boston up, or you're up against Boston three games to none, and you somehow find a way, in spite of them making an a impressive comeback, nonetheless, to go behind enemy lines and still pull out a dub. A year after the opposite happened to you. I, I got to get him a lot of credit. And Kayla Martin, especially, I had to give a lot of credit. Like, he scored 254 total points thus far in these playoffs while shooting 56.6% from the floor and nearly 44% from three 
heading into these NBA finals, stepping up mightily following the injury to Tyler Hero in the opening round in which he broke his hand. And he could be on his way back come game three of the finals against the Denver Nuggets. But I don't know how you just let him creep up into your rotation with the way Kayla Mar has been playing, especially on the defensive end of the floor. And you put all that together, man, it's just, it's just impressive. And it just goes to show you how you just got to stay ready for your moment and your opportunity. Because what Kayla Martin has provided this team with is some size, some athleticism, and the ability to be a 3 and D wing, which I alluded to in last week's show, was something that Miami didn't have the last time they went to the finals just a few years ago down in the bubble. So I've been very impressed with, with Miami like fully, you know, so I I can't get mad at you for going on a rant about Miami and what they've been able to accomplish. But I also want to highlight the Chicago sky in the WNBA, man. They currently out in action as we record this, taking on Ryan Howard and the Atlanta Dream out in College Park, boasting a three and one record through their first three games with the help of newcomers such as Marina Mabry, who chipped in 23 in a win against the Dallas Wings including Alana Smith, who added a double-double performance with 14 points and 12 rebounds to go alongside of six dimes to notch the first double-double in her WNBA career today. Kalia Copper, she seems to be embracing her new role as the captain and face of this franchise following the departures of Courtney Vandersloot and Candace Parker this past offseason. She scored in double figures. She's shooting 36% from downtown through the first four games for the Sky in her eighth season out of Rutgers. This is a team, man, that lost so many pieces this offseason. And we was wondering and questioning whether or not they was going to be able to find a way. And then you add all of that with the injuries that they've suffered early on this year with key players such as Rebecca Gardner, Morgan Mm -hmm. Birch, Isabel Harrison. They still finding a way to win. Even the loss, the lone loss they've had thus far to the Washington Mystics, it only came by two points. And then you add on the additions of players such as center Elizabeth Williams, who's been impressive on the defensive end, playing the passing lanes well, being an option in the pick and roll game besides Courtney Williams and Kalia Copper on offense. James Wade, I don't know what he's doing, but he appears to have successfully implemented a culture across this franchise as a head coach and a GM that appears to have long-term staying power no matter who is wearing a Sky uniform. And that's kind of cool to see, especially in a town where you have a lot of teams that have some front office ineptitude as well as when it comes to coaching. So to see it with James Wade doing his thing here in the Windy City, that's been cool. And I got to tip my cap to those two organizations as those have been the two main organizations that have caught my eye over the last week. And I'm interested to see just how much the sky can keep this thing going, especially with a big upcoming home and home series against the New York Liberty and Courtney Vandersloot set to make her return for the first time as a visitor at Wintrust Arena this coming Friday. Yeah, see, that's that's the biggest thing right there. Um, there's no secret that Coach Wade has a lot of hit and misses. Um, and there's no secret that when he hits, he hits. When he misses, he misses badly. Um, there's it's no, it's no question mark about it. So to see what he's been able to do so far, though, is a testament to a growing culture, I will say. Because you're, cause you're in, in a sense, they're rebuilding off of what they lost. And um, when you talk about a uh, regression standpoint, you won a championship and then you failed to get back to the WNBA Finals. And this year you weren't even, you were still expected to be a top 10 team per se. But you were more on the on the falling out of that side, uh, lower end of that. So, so far, so good. Uh, Marina Mabry has been a heck of an addition and a, a, a second piece in, from a duo perspective with Kalia Copper in that backcourt. It, it, they're making Dwayne, uh, I mean, not Dwayne Wade, they're making James Wade look like a genius out there. And that's great, especially with, and I think the addition of Cordy Williams helps a lot too, because they actually have a point guard that can, be versatile on both ends of the floor yeah. um that's making dana evans job that much easier so um i think so far like you said it's good it's great from the few times i wasn't able to catch some sky highlights um they look great 
But man, you got a long season ahead of you, and the teams are only going to get better. You just beat, you barely made it home in Washington, but you just talked about New York's coming in the building, New York's coming to town. Eventually, going to have Las Vegas coming to town, and all the other teams are and that are coming to ain't they're, they're not playing any games. So, can they maintain this? That's going to be the focus. I want to see if they can maintain this throughout the entire season in ways that they have been able to do in previous years. But so far, so good. Good start, considering that they are in a rebuild type of season or they're retooling heavily. I, I like to see what, the, what they're going to be doing moving forward. I agree. I, I, and even though it seems like a rebuild in the grand scheme because of the players that they lost, such as Courtney Vandersloot, Candace Parker, Allie Quigley, yep. who decided to sit out the 2023 WNBA season and was a longtime member of the Sky and a vital contributor, especially with a three-point shooting. This team looks more like a team that's retooling. And they don't look like they're willing or ready to lay down just for any team. Yeah, it's going to be some uphill battles with those teams that you alluded to, such as the New York Liberty and the Las Vegas Aces, those teams that many of us, including ourselves, expect to be in the WNBA Finals this year. But, man, if they could compete with those teams a little bit, you never know, especially with a playoff format like in the WNBA where you have these best of three first-round series and then you have these best of five, like, semifinal rounds and whatnot mm -hmm. like you never know what can happen that time of year if you put yourself in a good position so i'm excited to see what the rest of the year or the, in the, as well as the future holds for this scott group under james wade who i think has done a hell of a job from the moment he's come into chicago and trying to guide this franchise to the promised land which he's already done once in his career to date but i want to move on and discuss the Miami Heat, team that we talked about that impressed us the most in a series that had the makings of an epic comeback film by the Boston Celtics after erasing a 3-0 lead by the Miami Heat by way of winning two straight games with their backs against the wall. Things appeared to be falling in line for fans to witness the first 3-0 comeback in the history of the league. Yet in spite of an incredible game six down in South Beach, thanks to the late heroics of Derek White's follow-up bucket at the buzzer, shortly after Marcus Smart's missed three-point attempt that would help the Seas draw even in the series and force a game seven back in Boston after capturing two out of their three straight wins on the road to rally back in it. Their valiant effort would not be enough as the Seas would fall prey to key injuries to the likes of their own game six hero in white, Jason Tatum and Rob Williams and continue to have trouble with a heat zone defense that was able to find a way to help them avoid being on the wrong side of history as Miami captured a 19 point win behind enemy lines at the TD Garden to return the favor in which the Celtics handed them in the same scenario a season ago in a winner take all game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals. Jimmy Butler who averaged 24.7 points, 7.6 rebounds, and 6.1 assists per game through the seven hard-fought battles against the Celtics, earned the Larry Bird Trophy, capturing MVP honors of the Eastern Conference Final. Josh, let's just cut to the chase, bro. What are your key takeaways from this year's Eastern Conference Finals matchup in which the Heat and Celtics met up for the third time in the last four years and featured a road team finding a way to win in a game seven for the second straight year, albeit under crazier circumstances this time around. Two things. One with Miami, they're grown. They've grown. This ain't the Miami of last year. And then two, Boston, they have more growing up to do. Um, because when you think about Miami, um, Jimmy Butler vowed, I know you probably saw this, but Jimmy Butler vowed a year before exactly as of yesterday sure to did. say, hey, we're going to be back here in the same position, and this time we're going to win it next year. They came back, and he delivered. But it's the way Miami delivered. The way Miami uh, pretty much killed this entire series was defense that led into a transition game. And when the transition game uh, to, and and, and in, the, in the midst of that, making timely 
uh, good decisions. They didn't turn the ball over a lot. They were very, they were very, and they valued the possessions that they had. They took advantage of those. Um, when Miami turns over the ball a lot, that's when they out of rhythm. They're out of rhythm. They have to be a rhythm team for them to stay afloat and to flourish in games. So what Miami did in that game seven was show you what happens when they stick to the game plan, when they stick to aggressive defense and, and, and push the tra- transition game. But they also, when they have to slow down the ball in the half court, they are, t- they, they, pres- they timely make timely baskets, but as well are very um, protective of the ball. They don't, you know, they don't do a lot of unforced turnovers. And when you do that, that's the formula to success. And obviously Miami, they've been through this before. So they didn't play in a panic mode. They didn't seem wavered. Eric Spolstra, as the leader that he is, came up front and showed that he trusted and believed in his guys and let them play freely, which is why you saw guys like Caleb Martin snap all season, all series long. So uh, they've grown from this. They've grown from last year's experience. And they played a lot better in this game seven that ultimately gave them not just the victory, but a blowout. Um, Boston's issue, though, was they didn't grow up. They haven't grown up yet because they turned the ball over, turned the ball over like crazy. Yes, the injuries played a factor in some of this. I mean, it's, it's basketball. That's going to happen. However, they deviated from what they were good at because of the injuries. And that's not how the game plan should be. Um, Jason Tatum was not as aggressive, um, and when after his ankle injury, and that hurt Boston's flow. Um, but Jalen Brown, being that being the all NBA player that he is, he didn't he couldn't step up in ways that he's used to, he didn't come through, and he had eight turnovers. Um, so that that really hurt Boston too. And on top of that, on top of obviously, they didn't value the ball as much because they had so many turnovers. But this is where the growing pains of Joe Missoula kicks in. Because Boston was 0 for 12 in the beginning of the game from three. Instead of calming the team down, running an offense, running a separate play, or deviating from the three-point line so much from a force perspective, and maybe going to doing a lot with what Derek Wright was doing he's in the game, attacking the basket. Um, trying to get to the free throw line. The the Celtics just settled for threes all game long. And that was a recipe for disaster because they weren't hitting threes. I think they shot like 45 threes and only made nine. So if you're going to shoot so many threes, you they literally lived and died by the three. Instead of using the basketball IQ that I know that they have to say, okay, my threes aren't going down. I'm going to shoot open threes, but I'm not going to force threes. I should find other ways to score and facilitate and create for others in a position to win. And that's what Boston didn't do. They lacked that. And because they lacked that, when Miami was punching them in the mouth, they had no fight. They was like, it's a wrap. It was done. Game was pretty much over in the third quarter. And um, that was the difference maker in a lot of ways. So Miami has grown. In, as, as winning cultures and winning teams do. Boston showed that there's still young bucks in this game and they got some growing up to do still, um, especially if they're able to keep that core intact. So um, those, those were my biggest takeaways from the, from the Heat Celtics, man. And Miami showed that they deserved to be in the finals in the point blank period. I'm going to say this in regards to my key takeaways. I understand that Boston is still young, so to speak. But Jalen Brown has played in multiple Eastern Conference Finals Mm -hmm. over the last several years. Jason Tatum has played in multiple Eastern Conference Finals beside Jalen Brown over the last several years, okay? These two, a year ago, reached the NBA Finals together. Mm -hmm. My key takeaway on Boston side is this. The biggest difference between last year's series, 
versus this year is that last year when the offense faltered and fell short, defense was their calling card. This year was the exact opposite. Now, I don't know what was the difference between the two. Maybe it was Ime Udoka philosophy versus Joe Mazzula's philosophy, who I believe deserves a ton of credit for encouraging his guys to fight back because about a week ago, this series looked very ugly. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us were wondering, what does the Celtics' future really look like? However, I think we have a little bit more optimism when it comes to Missoula moving forward that his job for the meantime is at least safe. Mm -hmm. But it's the same old thing, just a different day with Boston. This team has grown up. But the problem with this team, as great as they are, they oftentimes beat themselves with things that you said the Heat didn't do in this series, which was commit too many unforced turnovers. Boston did that. Failure to capitalize on converting open three-point shots. Mm Mm-hmm. Miami went from being one of the worst three-point shooting teams in the regular season to being among the best of the best in this in this playoff run. Only the Denver Nuggets have shot the three-point ball better. And as you see, those two teams are in the finals. If you're going to live by the three ball, you got to be willing to die by it. They died by it. But the problem was is that when they died by it, when, when they decided to die by it, they were playing the game that the Miami Heat wanted them to play. Yeah. Which is why they run what? The infamous 2-3 zone. When they put that zone in in the second quarter, instead of trying to move the ball, which is what the Celtics do when their offense is humming and allowing that ball to find the open man for a clean look, which is usually converted more often than it's not, they stop moving the ball. Why? Because as Malcolm Brogdon alluded to in the press conference to cap off game seven, nobody out there trusted one another. And it showed. He didn't even have to say it for me to know it because it showed. And I got some numbers for you, man, that is really startling to me when it comes to the Celtics' inability to bust the zone. And this is from NBA.com. According to Synergy Tracking, the Celtics scored just 19 points on 34 zone possessions. They, They only really had, like, one good zone possession with multiple drives through the scenes, which led to, like, an in rhythm trade ball for Jalen Brown. But those were few and far between because they often shot shots off of what? Minimal ball movement. And when you struggling that bad on the offensive side of the ball, the way you letting it affect your defense, the one calling card that you had a season ago and that made you go from a team that so many of us had questions about to say, you know what? This is the best damn team in the Eastern Conference right now, and they're the best team in the playoffs, and they're going to win a championship. We didn't see that this year. Mm -hmm. We did not see that this year. And their half-court offense was far less efficient against the zone where they scored .76 points per possession than it was against a man-to-man set where they scored 1.05 points per possession. And that's data according to Synergy Track. And that was for this series total. And when you know the way in which Miami likes to play the zone, this is something they've been utilizing for years. I can't understand for the life of me why these NBA teams won't seek to adjust to it. Because being a 2-3 zone, and I know you know this having played the game for yourself, Josh, when you got talent, it ain't that damn hard to beat. You All you got to do is just move the ball and have guys cutting, reading and reacting to how the ball is moving. Because you're going to be able to exploit a hole or two in it. 
But most NBA teams, when they see Miami run that, what they do, they panic. And they want to shoot over the top, which only work if you're making shots. And the thing that's so amazing to me is that if you take game six away among the three Boston wins, I believe when they won games four and five, they had to shoot well over like 40% from three-point land. Mm -hmm. That was always the difference. As for Miami, Miami is what they told us they was going to be. And that's not your average eighth seed and that they view themselves as a one seed. I see why. Because they're not playing like one. And I got to give it to Jimmy Butler, man. This is my key takeaway from him. He came, he saw, he conquered. Mm -hmm. And I have to give him a bunch of respect. And that's a man I will not bet against in these NBA finals. I can tell you that right now. I will not bet against him because just when you think his team is done for, or just when you think he's done for, he finds a way to rise to the occasion. To go from five for 21 shooting from the floor to finding a way to put together a big performance and a win or go home scenario on the road after blowing an opportunity to close it out at home, kudos to you. Yeah, man. Uh, Jimmy Butler ain't no joke. I, I, I still get peeved that the Bulls got rid of him for scraps, but uh, that's neither here nor there. I Everything you said obviously hit the hit. It's spot on. But that eludes to, in some cases, coaching. You have to be able to prep your guys for those type of things. Miami is known at times to play 2-3 zone. It's, you, you can scout it. It's, it's right there. They did it in, earlier in the series. So how can you not prepare your guys to say, hey, they might play some 2-3 zone tonight if they, if, if they find out that they're hitting and we not. Let's prep ourselves to make sure we do this properly. And you don't do it properly. Some of these things, yes, I completely agree with you. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, Jalen Brown, they crapped the bed. That's just the reality. They crapped the bread. They did not show up when they needed to show up. And they had the experience to do so. However, this also shows that you got a rookie coach on the sidelines. And it wasn't even close. Because his adjustments did not compare to what Eric Spolstra did on the fly. And you can tell that whatever he tried to do, Spolstra was three steps ahead of him. Easy. And once he realized that, what else could he do? He he has no backup. This is where experience comes in. And we know, obviously, and I do believe, He will grow from this, obviously. However, in a crucial moment like that, yeah, you got outcoached and outworked pretty bad on that sideline. And you can't even shame him for doing against literally the best coach in the league. You can't can't shame him for that. But that played a big difference into what Boston was able to, to do during the game and also versus what Miami was able to do. Miami made adjustments that made their offense thrive. Missoula didn't make enough adjustments for the Celtics offense to have life. And on top of, like you said, the lack of defense, which is what Boston's accustomed to, you know, that, that, that's, that's your difference. And that's why we have the heat in the, in the NBA Finals now instead of the Boston Celtics. You know, it's funny you bring up how Spolstra was like three steps ahead of Joe Mazzulla. And for those who don't know, Joe Mazzulla is the youngest head coach in the NBA at 34 years old. Mm -hmm. And I said this last week on Open Run that he reminds me in some ways of another coach who entered his profession at a young age and became a head coach at a very young age, similar to the age in which Joe Mazzulla is right now, and that's Sean McVay, Mm -hmm. who reached his first Super Bowl at the age of 33 against 
the New England Patriots with the L.A. Rams, and he got exposed. And Bill Belichick ran a defensive clinic on him that was so amazing that after that Super Bowl and that offseason, McVay said, I felt like I was an amateur coaching up against him. And I learned some vital lessons, which a few years later proved to be vital to the Rams when they won the Super Bowl. Now, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that this is going to culminate in the same result for the Celtics in regards to them winning the NBA championship over the next few years, because winning an NBA championship is difficult. Not to say that winning the Super Bowl isn't, but it's very difficult, especially with the adjustments and the days in between games that guys get the rest as well as head coaches and assistants when it comes to making adjustments. But Joe definitely has to learn a, a, a lot. One of them is making necessary adjustments and being willing to call timeouts. You can't mm-hmm. coach these guys like you have Phil Jackson with the 1990 Chicago Bulls. You just can't do it. And this is a team that responds well to the, that type of coach that knows when to bring them in. We saw that with Ime Udoka. But I don't want to take anything away from Joe Mazzula because for a guy who was thrown into the fire just a couple of weeks before the regular season and told to take over the reins as the head coach on an interim basis, to do what he did with this group was nothing short of a phenomenal for me. You know, and, and I have to give him his credit because when you're going up against Eric Spolster, who's one of the top coaches in the history of this game, and this your first rodeo, it ain't going to be easy. But I, I think he, he put up a valiant effort. And I want to ask you a question in regards to the Boston Celtics, man, a team that we thought was buried underwater last week. And we discussed whether or not Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum could work as a parent and whether or not Joe Mazzula's job is safe. But after seeing what you did from this Celtics team over the past week, who fought back from a 3-0 deficit, nearly became the first team ever to accomplish what many deem to be the impossible, what direction do you believe that Boston should go in now? We've been hearing reports from Sham Sharani over the last 24 hours or so that they're going to seek to add some veteran coaches, specifically former head coaches, on the bench to help Missoula out a little bit, which I think could be helpful. But from Mm -hmm. a roster standpoint, man, like what you think this team is missing? Because last year I saw a team, man, that lost in six games to the Golden State Warriors in the NBA Finals, and I thought they were the better team. I just thought they lost to the more experienced team. I think that happened the second year as well, except one round short of the finals in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Miami Heat. Yeah, that that's the that's the surprising thing for me, because the reality is, you pretty much had the same roster last year when you went to the finals as you came in this year, minus maybe Malcolm Brogdon and Blake so, Griffin. Yeah, and Blake Griffin. So because of that, I, me personally, I don't think it's a roster issue. I think they're set. That I, I think at the end of the day that adjustment from a head coach perspective really nipped them in the bud in moments when it counted the most. Because as much as Joe Mazzula is still learning this position, it's a difference between someone that, you know, has the rep that he has with top tier talents and gain respect from the superstars of this franchise. They respond differently to someone who just got elevated. And the main guy that they really trusted is not there anymore. That takes time. Because now, because now as stars, you didn't have to question you man Yudoka and what he knows. We we knew coming into him seven accepting the Boston job in the first place. He was going to work well with this squad. And he's shown that he was going to work well with the squad. That was a given. But Joe Mazzula, he's just coming off the bench. As someone that has played the game, it's a lot different when you're accustomed to one voice that you highly respect versus when that voice is taken away. You got to listen to somebody else on that bench that you may or may not have respect for. There's a difference. 
and how you respond and how you play. It's going to take time for Missoula to gain that voice back, to earn that voice. Because it's different from when you come with someone like Ime Yudoka and the track record that he has. In the first year, applying that pressure of winning, of going to the finals and being two games away from winning a championship. That's different than you just, than, than this new guy coming in. And he's young. And it's his very first experience. So, you, and, and you're talking about that type of a head coach with what you just mentioned earlier. Two superstars has been to at least two Eastern Conference Finals already. That's that's a whole different that's a whole different ball game. So, I think the biggest thing is what Boston said they're going to do from the recent reports. Get give Joe Mazzulli some help on that bench. Give him some veteran leadership. Give him some uh, some guidance because you've committed to this guy in the long term. Now, this means you need to develop him as a coach. Why not bring the best that's available to help assist him in that journey? Knowing that with the stars that you already have and the roster you already have, is already a championship-made roster. You don't have to do many changes to it. And you have a, and, and, and unless you re-sign Jalen Brown, you're going to have everybody coming back next year and, for, and be there for, I believe, multiple seasons. So you're pretty much solidified. That's good. You already got the championship roster there. You need to get the championship leadership straight, cause that's a cause that's cause that's a gap. Whether people see it or not, that's a huge gap between Mozula and Ime. Even though Ime only did it in his first year, that's a huge gap. And from a player's perspective, that's tough to deal with. So that's the biggest thing that Boston, to me, has to handle. Man, you know, I, I I've been thinking as you was making your points, and it's well said and and, and thought out. But, like, Boston done been to the Eastern Conference Finals, I want to say, four out of the last six years. If you include their run in 2018, when they lost to the Cavaliers during LeBron's last year in Cleveland in seven Mm -hmm. games, then they got to the Conference Finals down in the bubble in 2020 where they lost to the Heat in six. And then they got there last year where they finally got over the hump and beat the Heat in seven. And then this year when they lost to the Heat in seven, despite coming back from a 3-0 deficit. I know that the roster, the majority of the roster will be kept intact and rightfully so. I understand the reason as to why. I do believe that they will seek to re-sign Jalen Brown. And as long as Jalen Brown wants to be there, I believe that they can get that done. Now, if he doesn't, that's a different story. And that will be an all-season saga that a lot of people should be interested in following. But with that said, when you talk about the direction that they should go in, I I really don't know. that. To me, that's the million-dollar question. Like, how can Brad Stevens improve his roster? I, I, I know that they were missing Danilo Gallinari, who mm-hmm. tore his ACL and was expected to be a big presence for that second unit to, to supply them with some shooting. But the thing that's going to be interesting to see is what new offensive wrinkles that they seek to add come next season. Because whatever they do, they can't be such a one-dimensional offense to where they rely so much on scoring from beyond the arc that if they're unable to do it, that it takes away from the thing that makes them so great. And you see get opened up when they are making shots, and that's running the floor and getting buckets out in transition. Mm-hmm. Cause all that gets like swatted out when they're not able to make threes at a high volume. And the thing that is like crazy to me is that they didn't have a counter at all. And and, and Eric Spolstra said it in Game Two or after Game Two when. He was encouraging his team to weather a Boston run. He said, if they're not making threes, they can't win. And, you know, to me, that's been the story of this whole Celtics era currently. Mm -hmm. No matter who's been the head coach, whether it was with Brad Stevens during the Isaiah Thomas era when they were making it to the conference finals with a young Marcus Smart and a a rookie Jalen Brown, whether it was with I may you doka 
you know, whether it's been with Joe Missoula thus far to date, like y'all have gone through three different coaches and had great success with them. But for some odd reason, it's not working enough to culminate in a championship. When it comes to what direction they should go in, I don't know, but I don't see anybody walking out the door. Mm -hmm. But I do think that some guys individually need to work on their game a little bit as opposed to the moves that they have. Like, you take a guy like Jason Tatum. He got all the moves in his bag. But it's about finding a way to simplify things when you're in the playoffs. You got to find out how to get to your spots. You don't need 10, 8 to 10 dribbles to get to your spots all the time. Cut that down from 8 to 5 to like, I mean, 8 to 10 to like 5 to 6. Yeah. Same with Jalen Brown. That's what leads to a lot of turnovers. They get into that iso ball stuff and they get away from moving it. And they offense don't feature a lot of movement anyway compared to like the Denver Nuggets who play in like a San Antonio style setup. But when they moving a the ball around, it don't matter because it's, it's, it's like poetry in most. It's finding an open man. But it stops when it gets to guys like Tatum sometimes and Brown who oftentimes like to settle for shots, leading to forced turnovers, leading to transition opportunities for the opposing team. Yeah, um, those things definitely do happen. Um, and I know we talked about how we don't see it. It's going to be very – it's pretty much almost impossible at this point, especially if Jalen Brown comes back um, and resigns that deal, and resigns that next big deal, um, for Boston really to improve this roster. But all the what, what kept coming to my mind as you were saying all this is what I said in all the previous shows. Boston might be feeling some type of way about giving this extension to Joe Mazzula too early. Because imagine if, just imagine if he was still under that interim tag and he didn't get that guarantee. You got some options out there that maybe can give you what you're looking for and tweaking the offense a little bit that can get the respect of the players to help them go back in the gym and work on their games like that. Because we know how things go. If they don't have that strong voice and that strong ear that's going to tell them they need to work on that game, they ain't going to work on that improving their game. They're just going to build on what they have. If you have a top 10 coach that has respect to players like that to do that, maybe you might see a different player coming in next year. I'm not saying that's the case in Boston. I don't know if that's the case in Boston. But I think whether they believe it or not, Joe, they might have some slight regret on giving Joe Mazzulla that, that, that tag, even though I agree, he deserved it. He deserved that long-term deal, what he's done with this team. But they might regret it because of this specific scenario that we talked about. And knowing that the coaching pool is so diverse now and there's so many options, I don't know if I would have given him that tag knowing that there could be that many potential good options, better, good or better quote-unquote options out there. But let's say what they have right now, yeah, they players got to work on their games for sure. They should be working on their games every season to improve in, in every aspect of their, of their skill sets. But the coach got to work on that game too. You got to sharpen his mind and you got to sharpen his skill set, and which leads to better practices on the court. And this is the first time in, in quite some time, as a matter of fact, that Boston, outside of Yume Yudoka, have had to go through this type of process, this growth process. They had to do it with Brad Stevens. He's done it for a while over there. But now, you know, with Yume gone, Joe Mazzu is going to take that same process and that's going to take time. And the real question is, does Boston have that much time to wait? Because you, because what, because what, like we talked about before, they've been to the Eastern conference finals, at least four out of the last six years. They, and they've hit the finals once. Eventually something's going to have to give. If you want to take that next step, look what Milwaukee's done. Look what all the other teams in the league are doing to improve their chances. 
I'm just saying Boston is eventually going to get to that point too if nothing improves. I mean, yeah, they, they definitely going to get to that point. They definitely are. But when you got $14 million on the books for the next three years with Joe Mazzulla on his contract, according to Sham Sharania, I don't see them just leaving that necessarily. And plus, he's a young coach who you can still grow with. I think Joe mm-hmm. Mazzulla will adjust and learn from his experiences. I, I truly do. I question whether or not Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum will come this all season. But whatever they do, they need to find a way to come closer together because if they don't, I don't see this ending in a dream-like scenario that so many fans in Beantown might have hoped for when those two were first paired together and they initially showed signs of that they were going to be capable of doing it about five or six years ago. But I want to ask you real quick, Josh, we thought we was going to see a 3-0 series come back and we didn't for the first time in NBA history. We really thought we was going to see it. Do you think we will ever see an NBA team come back from a 3-0 series deficit and win it someday? Yeah, I think someday we will. Um, But it just shows you how difficult it is to win four straight games against the same exact team (laughs) with less time to prep and adjust. It's just that difficult. That's why it's never been done. Um, I do think eventually someone's going to crack. Some team is going to crack. And, um, you know, I could, and you can pretty much argue that if it was any other team outside of Miami, you might, you might have seen that. Um, But I don't know how soon it's going to happen. I just don't know how soon it's going to happen. But I think it can definitely still be done. I feel you. Me, I I think it'll happen someday. I really thought it was going to happen in this series. But then again, when you have an experienced team like the Miami Heat, even if they look gassed, you can't count them out. And this this was a wild series. I'll just put it like that. This was a wild series. But this was the one time that I thought a team had a perfect chance to do it, especially with game seven on their home turf in the Celtics. Mm -hmm. But they didn't capitalize or take advantage of it. And it just goes to show you how the biggest difference between winning and losing can oftentimes come within like a single possession. Maybe if Boston takes care of business in game two, this series is a different story and it don't even go to the seventh game. But I want to move on and discuss some recent news around the league, specifically regarding the head coach and carousel. The Sixers have agreed to terms with Nick Nurse on becoming the next head coach of the franchise in Philadelphia. Meanwhile, the Bucks have decided to go with Adrian Griffin as the coach following a meeting with Giannis in the midst of Milwaukee search. The finalists for the Bucks job were Griffin, who got the job, Kenny Atkinson from Golden State, as well as Nick Nurse, who actually pulled his name last minute from the head coach and search for the Bucks, and agreed to terms with Philadelphia on becoming a head coach and said that the enticement of being able to coach the MVP Joel Embiid was enough for him to link up with his good friend Daryl Morey. What are your thoughts on that? It's, it, it honestly was really interesting to hear these names come out. I did not know, or I was put this way, I was not as um, aware or reminded of the fact that Nick Nurse had such a rapport with Daryl Morey. Oh yeah, I could have told you that one. Through. I forgot I to bring that up last week. Yeah, that they go blew- back. They go back to uh, they go back to the Rockets. That yeah, was, that, that was really the coach that Daryl let get away in Houston because gotcha. when when Daryl was in Houston. Nick Nurse led the G League affiliate of the Rockets, the Rio Grande Valley Vipers, to a G League championship. And I believe I he was an that, assistant. Yeah. I believe he was an assistant w- with the Rockets as well. And that's the guy that he, he let get away. So I wasn't too surprised when that name came about. But they hit it very well, I must say. 
because I, I wasn't expecting Nick Nurse to land there, especially when he was a highly coveted man. And mm-hmm. not only did the Milwaukee Bucks want him, he turned down the job opening with the Phoenix Suns. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was, uh, I was kind of shocked with that, but it wasn't surprising. But the, what really got me was Milwaukee. Giannis is playing chess, not checkers. Because, yeah, it's great to have Giannis in the meeting saying he vouched for a guy. That's great. There's one problem if I'm the owner, though. You ain't signed a contract extension with me, bro. So you telling me you want this guy and we're going to try him long term. Are you going to be here when he signs his four or five year deal? Because I think you got another year or two left in your deal and you ain't signed no extension with me. So Giannis is keeping his options open. Now, I don't think Giannis is going to go anywhere. He doesn't come off as someone that wants to team up with other players in different in the big city markets and all that type of stuff. He doesn't come off as that guy. However, Giannis is applying pressure on the franchise. And he's doing it in a heck of a way. It started with him being slightly publicly open and saying that I didn't agree with Mike Budenholzer and how he handled that uh, Miami Heat series. You know? Letting it known that, you know, he, he messed this up. It's time for him to go. Knowing that he was on a hot seat previously. And then you're in a meeting with him. Adrian Griffin, who, by the way, before his situation a few years ago, was actually in a lot of in the running for a lot of top head coaching positions, including Chicago. So he was already known to be a good coach that was deserving of a head coaching job. Um, Giannis. Vouchers for him doesn't surprise me. That actually, that's actually perfectly fine. But I know in the back of my mind, he's saying is I want to see what he's going to do. I got a few, I got a, I got a year, a couple of years here, a year or two left. I want to see how this, how this is going to go. Cause I vouch for him, but I want to see how ownership is going to continue to build this roster. I want to see how they're going to continue to get things uh, moving forward. Because if I don't have, if I don't sign an extension, I'm free. And that's going to be putting the off. He's already shown that this offseason, I'm not playing no more games. I'm trying to get back to the finals. And that type of pressure, obviously Milwaukee is, is going to do whatever it takes to get the job done, which is why they asked for Giannis's approval on this guy. But Giannis is playing chess, not checkers. Don't get it twisted. It's not like Giannis is dying to play with this guy. Giannis. Is letting it be no, I, I respect him. He's good. Let's bring him in. But I'm sending you guys straight either way. Because if I'm here, we'll win games. If I stay long term, we'll win games. We'll be cool. If I'm not here, at least you got our first year head coach, rookie head coach that you can work with that still be under contract. And whoever you guys come in, bring in to replace me, you can't really go against him because this is his first real coaching game. He'll be prepared for the scenario. That's what that's what I think is the underlying factor of all this for me. Giannis is letting the world know I approve this guy, but he's not my solution. Y'all got to get other things straight before I even think about signing a contract extension. I'm not worried about him not signing a contract extension. I tell you why. I don't see Giannis, who has two years left on his deal, Three, if you include the player option, which the player option years I have in front of me will be going into the 25-26 season in which he's projected to make 51.9 mil. I don't see him walking away from that. Now, he could probably request a trade if he wanted. And I think Milwaukee would easily honor his request considering the fact that he signed an extension there prior to them winning a championship Mm -hmm. and decided not to even hit the free agency market however when i when i when i look at the the fact that he hasn't signed an extension that don't bother me as much because one the bucks have shown a strong commitment to Giannis. i feel like with this head coach and hire anytime you able to say as a star player i got a chance to meet with the top three finalists for the job personally and sit down and have conversations with them 
most stars can't say that. Yep. You know, when you when you got that type of leverage, that's pretty cool as, as a superstar in the league. And, and that's really what it means is that you you a true superstar and the franchise values your partnership. And I think Milwaukee is smart enough to know that they have to do everything in their power to make this work. Like they're going into, I think this season they had the third highest payroll in all of basketball. That's rare. To put mm-hmm. that into perspective for some of you fans that don't pay attention to salary cap numbers, they spend more money than the Bulls did. You know, and even though they got some money coming off the books, they ain't got too much to play with. They're going to get real creative as far as how they want to construct and build their roster or retool it in an effort to get back a top of the NBA and, and win another Larry O'Brien trophy for the city of Milwaukee. But I think the Bucks honestly got the closest thing that they could get to Nick Nurse by getting Adrian Griffin. Mm. And the reason why I say that is, is he spent the past four years as Nurse's top assistant in Toronto. Yep, He's getting his first head coaching job, and he comes with a reputation as a high-level defensive coach, Mm -hmm. which is something that the Bucs value mightily, and we know them to value very well as they've been among one of the game's top defenses for the last several years under the Mike Budenholzer era prior to his departure. So this is a guy that's built his defensive principles under some solid head coaches in this league, like Scott Skiles, Billy Donovan, Nick Nurse, Tom Thibodeau here in Chicago, who helped him get his start in the coaching. It was one of the main reasons, I think, why he was considered as a finalist for the Bulls head coaching job just a few years ago. He also has a history with John Horse, who is the Bucks GM, who was in the front office when Griffin started his coaching career in Milwaukee. And like I said, this man done climbed up. And one thing I do like about the Adrian Griffin hire, he's good when it comes to working with guys. Yeah. On skills. Like, he played a big part in helping Jimmy Butler behind the scenes. A lot of people don't know that, man. Um, Pascal Siakam as well. So I'm very yeah. excited to see what he could do with Giannis. And I think the Bucks may have struck gold with Adrian Griffin. It still remains to be seen, but I think that they may have found a way to do to make this work. And as far as you know, things go with Nick Nurse, I'm very curious to see that one. And I'll tell you why. Nick Nurse is going from a team in Toronto where he had defensive wings who were extremely versatile and could cover a lot of ground and position, like to play up-tempo and get the ball in transition off of a rebound, off of a steal or whatever and score, to now he's coaching one of the slowest teams in the league. And this is going to be a style adjustment. And I'm curious to see if James Harden comes back to Philadelphia how right. will he fit with alongside of Nick Nurse? Or how will he get accustomed to playing besides Nick Nurse? I'm, I'm very, I'm very interested to, to see how that's gonna work because to go from a team that's very athletic and loves to get up and down to a team that's among the bottom half of the league in pace, man, how you gonna make that work? And and I think this is where. Nick Nurse, or Gerald Moore, uh, respectively, I think he knows James Harden is gone, which is why he made this hire. Because mm-hmm. uh, when you talk about picking up the pace, when you when you when you lose to James Harden, you're gonna have to get somebody younger. Who is the free agent that's gonna be available this offseason from a point guard position that has familiarity with Nick Nurse? Fred Van Vliet. Don't tell me Fred Van Fleet's not going to be intrigued by going to Philadelphia to play with Joel Embiid, the MVP of the league, in a pick and roll situation. And you know, coming off the bench, you got Tyrese Maxey on the other side. I don't, I, that's going to be hard to turn down. And I think that's part of their game plan. They know James Harden because you talked about the fit. I don't see James Harden fitting with Nick Nurse either. And I think this determined that, um, that Daryl Morey is saying that, okay, James, we appreciate what you've done here. And we know you both likely going to go. 
But this is Joel Embiid's team. He's the now, and he's going to be the future. So we got to build, do what's best for him. And Nick Nurse, being the offensive genius that he can be, combined with defensive presence that he's eventually going to have to build over there, um, I think they're playing for that type of game. And James Harden doesn't fit that. So what better way to do that by saying, okay, Nick Nurse, come on in. Joel Embiid, I'm going to try to put you with one of the youngest, yet most known guards in the league. And that can get the, that has shown that can get the job done. I think Fran Van Vliet's going to fill that void. I, I never thought about Van Vliet going to Philly. I ain't going to lie to you. I, I think James Harden might actually consider staying in Philadelphia. I don't think it's a done deal by any stretch. I think mm -hmm. he's going to take his time, and he rightfully should, as this is his first time hitting the free agency market, albeit in his mid-30s. But I, I think that Nick Nurse and James can work. I just don't know what their identity is going to be moving forward because Nick Nurse is undergoing a new change. He's going from playing with guys that are young and athletic that he can experiment with and tinker with in various situations, a, a veteran laden roster, man, that plays very slow. And he said he is excited to have a chance to coach Joel Embiid, which I understand. But Joel Embiid versus Pascal Siakam, them two different type of players. Mm-hmm. I do believe that they will seek to get a piece. For Evan Vliet, I don't know. I think if I think if they lose James Harden, that's a team that you're gonna have to watch down the line, possibly trying to figure out a way to do some type of draft night deal for a superstar guard or something. If not, then after the draft. But that remains to be seen. But I, I don't mind the Nick Nurse hiring at all. I, I don't mind it. They needed a guy that was a culture changer. And, and, and I, I like the fact that Daryl finally got his guy because a lot of people always wonder in Houston, had they found a way to hold on to him there, whether or not he would have been the guy to lead Harden to the promised land when he was down there. Mm. No, that makes that that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be very interesting. I just it's gonna be very interesting to see um, how that goes. Yeah, for sure. It's it's, it's definitely a, a a stretch per se, but it, I do think that's gonna be something that's hard to turn down. Uh, when you talk about Fred Van Fleet potentially playing with Joel Embiid in the East in a team that has Eastern Conference championship aspirations NBA finals aspirations and he knew what it was like when he was playing in NBA finals aspirations with Kawhi and Kyle Lowry those guys and Nick Nurse was at the helm why not I, I'm pretty sure he would go he's open to going wherever but having Nick Nurse there and you knowing that he's capable of winning with him and you got Joel Embiid on your side plus a bag that's gonna be hard to turn down to the first day of free agency my man. For sure. But I, I, I want to move on and talk about the latest news coming out of the Bay Area with Bob Myers, man. Yeah. Talking about a four-time NBA champion executive, two-time recipient of the Executive of the Year Award, decided to step down as the president and general manager of the Golden State Warriors. What are your thoughts on that? Is this appears to put a cap on the end of what's been an incredible era out there in San Francisco and the Oakland region. Um, you know, I really thought he had at least one more year in him. I thought he was going, I thought he was going to have one more year in there to give it a go and um, allow Draymond to sign into his option, player option, and just ride this thing out one more year, see if they can get the job done especially since with the way they performed as far as, you know, beating the Kings in the seven game series with Steph still having the big performance that he had and then going into the uh, Western conference semifinals. But 
when I think about it more, and obviously you did call this saying that he was going to be done. So shout out to you, Gabe, obviously. Um, when I think about it more, he was doing the Warriors a service. He was doing them a service. He did, he he allowed himself to move out the way a year in advance. So that way the new guy that comes in, whoever takes charge, can make the decisions that he knew he he knew he he would have to make, but he didn't want to make. He, he if he, if he was there, he would have kept the core. He would have asked to go over the luxury tax again. He would have probably gave Draymond a new deal, Clay a new deal. Let's run this shit back. That's not a guarantee now, and because it's not a guarantee, and the Warriors have shown that they could be compatible with that core, but. The, the wearing and tearing, the years are catching up to them. And because it's slowly but surely catching up to them, you still got a prime stuff. He's more like LeBron in an older prime, but he's got he's still in his prime. Um, and Clay is slowly but surely coming out of that prime. And same with Draymond. The, the, this, gives us, this gives the new guy a chance to start off the new era in the way he would want it to go while there's still some value left in some of these guys, while there's still some options to work with. Um, and I'm not sure Bob Myers at this point would have made those type of choices because he's so endeared to those guys that he helped put together and draft from the beginning and won four championships with. That would have been tough for him to do. Um, and it's not like a last dance situation where, you know, the, the the Bulls front office made it known it was going to happen regardless, and they were still winning championships. You know, Golden State lost pretty bad in this in this last goal round. Um, and I'm pretty sure if they retooled the roster, they could be fine. But at the end of the day, um, Bob Myers couldn't take that chance. And because he couldn't take that chance, he made sure on the back end that his, you know, retirement duties uh, to – Took uh, you know kicked in with his deals, but you know Omaha Productions and and things of that sort. So he made sure that he had his his exit plan in place, so that when this time did come, he was ready to move on. And this was definitely that time. Oh, he had his exit plan in place. I mean, we we talked about this, and we've been talking about this off and on since the early yeah. part of the winter. Yeah, prior to All Star break, that this could be a possibility. And I highlighted that is one of the main reasons why, you know, for those who don't know, like Myers agreed to a deal with Omaha Productions to have his own podcast. And he's out here interviewing people that are very highly successful within the entertainment and sports industry from the likes of Steph Curry and J. Cole, among others, you know, doing putting together some dope content. But even though that's a, a nice exit plan, Bob Myers is a young dude yep. in the NBA world as far as executives go. Like, he only 48. He's only 48. And I think what this sets up is an opportunity for him to become one of the most highest paid executives in the history of North American sports. Yeah. And I'm curious to see who is going to be in line for him across the NBA? I think a team in Southern California should be on speed dial mm -hmm. to at least ask him, would you be willing to consider a job as the president of basketball operation? Yeah, he got exit plans in place, but we're talking about a guy that has played the game at the collegiate level, which is a member of the UCLA Bruins back in the mid-90s. He's been an agent for players. I don't think he's going to fully lead a game. If I'm the Orlando Magic, I'm interested in trying to bring him in to some type of role or, or what have you. Charlotte Hornets as well, knowing that I had a number two pick on the line. I don't think he's going to take a job right away, and, and I don't think he should. But I know that if I was an executive or an owner of a franchise in the NBA right now, I would love to know what his price is. I just would. Because I don't think 
that this is goodbye forever for him from the game. I just think it's goodbye from the Golden State Warriors. And he put it very simple and plain where he said, basically, it's time. And I think it was time because of the reasons which you alluded to, Josh. He wasn't willing to make the tough decisions on guys such as Draymond Green and Klay Thompson regarding their future with the Warriors. Why? Because he had built such a great thing there that he became very close to these guys. And if it's one thing I know about the business of sports, basketball, baseball, any sport, when you win championships and you do that throughout a given decade, it's hard to make that decision to usher guys out the door. That's tough. That's very tough. And it's not an easy. And it's not easy to sustain that when people expect you to. Because he took an organization that hadn't seen playoffs on an annual basis and turned that into a rite of passage for some young Warriors fans to the point where I'm pretty sure if you told them about the Warriors during like the era or when shows like Hanging with Mr. Cooper was on the air, they would, they would realize that like this franchise, as rich as the history is with past greats such as Nate Thurman, Will Chamberlain, and Rick Barry, among others, they haven't won in a very long time. That's changed now. Yeah, it definitely changed. I mean, it's changed even since we even since the We Believe era. Exactly. I mean, exactly. These kids not even gonna know what that's like anymore. So um, no, you're right though. And I'm telling you right now, or what I believe is going to happen, yeah. LA's on the line because they got LeBron James still over there still. And they're gonna and with what's been going on with them, oh. He's like, I, I know he's going to be like, uh, I need a change because you want me to retire? I can retire out of this thing in two years. The pressure. Um, I could definitely see L.A. trying to make a move for him and things of that sort. Um, or just any team in general. I would not be surprised if he does come back um, for, to another team, whatever that looks like. Because out of, outside of all the reasons you just mentioned, we have to be mindful of the fact that there's one particular reason that worked in Golden State's favor. There was a guy named Jerry West that served as a consultant or advisor with the Warriors and Bob Myers at one point before he transitioned to the Clippers, the, the Clippers in LA, and started rebuilding the Clippers brand. I'm pretty sure he, my, Bob Myers has a thing or two of what it means to be an advisor. He learned that from Jerry West because that led to championships. Matt, I'm pretty sure he would not mind doing that type of role, advising teams to go after certain players to certain teams and use certain connections that he has to rebuild a dying franchise. That's a given. That's a new challenge that I think he would love to embrace. And Jerry, Jerry West clearly was in his office giving him the blueprint. So I can see that taking place as well. Um, and we shouldn't really put it past him if that was to take place. I think he'll take a year off, build his Omaha Productions podcast and all the things he's doing off the court. But yeah, those calls are going to come. Teams like maybe Toronto once they figure out what what Messiah New Jersey is going to do, or if they're going to get, or if he goes to another team. Um, you know, this it, it's a lot of options out there that for him. I wish the Bulls was on the phone. I wish the Bulls would give him a call. He could take John Paxson spot any day, but. At the end of the day, you know, he is going to have a plethora of options at his feet. And he gets to, you know, rightfully so, choose whatever one works best for him. Yeah, there's a lot of rumors you could spread about where he could go and if he was even to come back into the game. But the best thing about it is he put himself in the best position to do so, which is something not a lot of executives would do at the times that they're doing it. He did it at just the right time. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And speaking of the Bulls, I want to transition right now 
into a discussion involving recent reports surrounding Lonzo Ball's future. There was a report that dropped over the weekend, courtesy of 670 The Scores, Dan Bernstein, where he said on the Organization's Wins Championships podcast that the Bulls privately believe that Lonzo Ball's playing days are over and that they fear the worst in regard to the former lottery draft picks ailing left me. What are your thoughts on that, Josh? I think that this is something that a lot of fans have been thinking about here in Chicago over the last couple of years after, you know, you get these reports saying, well, he had surgery and he had to get another surgery. Sometimes he's, you know, like they said, like he's not even able to like run all this. Like, what what are your thoughts on these recent reports, man, that sound so depressing that it, it in some ways, even if you have no attachment to sports in Chicago, you, you can't help but feel for this guy. Yes, um, it's a gloomy situation, unfortunately. And it doesn't help that you have no picks in this draft and you talk about trying and you talk about trading every and you're not willing to at least at this point be so openly public to saying that you can trade certain people to get the point guard that you want. Um, and you ain't got no money, you ain't got no cap space, you know, and there's no clear direction about where the bulls are gonna go with this thing. So um at this present moment. It's, it's, it's very up in the air and unfortunate uh, for the Bulls, and I don't think they're going to have a chance to solve it in the way that they want to, especially since talks are looming that they're trying to bring back Vucevic. Um, they started uh, started those discussions already. So um, it's unfortunate. I hate that he has to go through this because um, he was honestly the perfect fit for what Billy Donovan was trying to do in Chicago. And is like that just withered away. But I don't think his career is fully done. I think he would have to change his game. Um, talk to Brandon Roy about this at, at the draft lottery. And that's this is someone that you know um, was a star in his league, an all-star on top of it, that his career got short at 27 because of all the nailing knee injuries that he went through. And he had similar surgeries to what Lonzo had to go through. Um, he said there's still hope for this kid because he's young. And he said that he doesn't have to move in the way that he himself did. Brandon Roy couldn't fathom with the fact that he will not be all-star Brandon Roy anymore. And because of that, he didn't want to hear it from the public and the media. It was the driving force to him exiting the league early he admitted that you know he could have played on team still been a been a, been a help and a resource didn't have to play all the minutes etc still be a key uh force off the bench but he turned it down because of his internal issues if Lonzo Ball doesn't have that mentality with Brandon Roy, which I don't believe he does I think he's like as long as I want to get on the court as much as I can he can change his game and ride this thing out and have a 15 year career still. He just won't be able to play 40 minutes a game. He won't be able to, you know, be as athletic as he used to be. He have to be more precise. He have to be smarter on the, the angles that he takes defensively. He has to be more of a, he'll have to amplify his floor general role that he already has been doing. He has to take it to another level. He will have to improve his jump shot. Yes, going into this past, into the, when he was in the season that he first year with the Bulls, he was shooting over, he was shooting forty percent from three before he got hurt. He would have to improve on that, um, and develop a mid range game, not just a three point game, but a mid range game. Because when you do a lot more pick and roll, you're going to have to be able to. They're going to have to. They're going to leave that space for you to flourish. He's going to have to take advantage of that. He might. He might also have to uh, improve himself and get himself a floater, a floating jump shot which he's not known for having. So 
he would have to adjust his game. The player that Brandon Roy said that he would highly advise Lonzo Ball to look at, we talk about adjusting his game like that, if he was to talk to him, was Andre Miller. That's a, like veteran, that. a, a veteran point guard that was a floor general, and he may not have been the most athletic guy, but he was precise on both ends of the floor, and he got the job done. That's something that Lonzo Ball can still do in this league at 6'7", and a point guard on top of that. That's still possible. But he has to be willing to accept that and adjust his game to move toward that, knowing that this is going to be the last, last time he's going to get a big payday and play at the level that we know that he, that, he could, that he could have been playing at. Now, when it comes to the Bulls, yeah, it's unfortunate because you need it now. You have no other solutions. You went all in on this quarter. And is now vanishing in front of you. It's vanishing in front of your fingertips. And I can see why they want to hang on and try to make this work. But until you make some major moves to your roster to bring in a point guard, you highly feel it, that is young, athletic, or even if it's a better point guard that can fit the salary cap space necessary to bring that type of player in, the Bulls are stuck. And if they had a top three or four pick in this draft, that would have changed everything. Because you you could have done some moving around, you could have got School Henderson as your point guard, or you could have used that pick to get somebody else. However, that's not the case, and the situation is real gloomy, just like it is in just like just like it is right now in Lonzo Ball's realm. But fortunately for someone that has gone through that, and Brandon Roy, Lonzo Ball has a little bit of hope to know that his career doesn't have to end up in the way that many people want it to be or expect it to be. And that's a saving grace that I think can be- that that can benefit him. You know, when I, when I look at the Lonzo ball situation, like you said, I, I think he's a team first player. Lonzo's a guy that is very special. He doesn't really have to dominate a game by scoring. Mm-hmm. He, he could dominate a game in more ways than just one whether that's with his abilities as a floor general, as you alluded to, as a, a playmaker creating shots for others, as well as on the glass rebounding. Only thing that would be my biggest concern with him going forward is his ability to defend at a high level. Right. That, to me, is what made Lonzo Ball a special player. And a player who I believed at one point in time would not only be an all-star in this league, but a guy that would lead the league in assists and a guy that would also be a first-team all-defense selection. I really believe that. Now, I don't know. But when I hear reports like that, it's very depressing. As a fan of the game, no matter what allegiance I have to a specific franchise, and I have none, there's there's no bias here. But I, I hate to see that because I know how important just watching this Bulls team over the last couple of years with the likes of DeMar DeRozan, Nikola Vucevic, and Zach Levine, I know how important he is to that offense. Mm -hmm. He's the man that makes the whole regime go. Mm -hmm. And anytime you have a veteran such as DeMar DeRozan, who has played in multiple big-time games in the playoffs and has made all-star games on a perennial basis say this directly to the media on the eve of the bulls getting ready for their first round playoff series against the milwaukee bucks a season ago that speaks volumes for me um i i'm I'm very concerned about the reports i don't think it's over but i do wonder if he's played his last game in a bulls uniform if he has it's really unfortunate because Bulls fans didn't get a chance to really see this guy at his best. They just got a little snippet of it. And I do feel for, for the fans that were going to the United Center 41 times a year in the hopes that they could watch Lonzo Ball take that floor. And it, 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 I, I don't know how they I – don't, I really don't know how they're going to adjust to this. I don't. And like you said, they, they need a point guard. It's been a lot of recent reports and rumors that there's a possibility that a reunion with Derrick Rose could be in the cars. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
man, when you when you see this report on Lonzo, man, it just com- it's 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 worth it, it's my worst fears confirmed. Yeah. You know, it's like people been thinking this, but no one's really said it. And now it's finally been said. But wherever he goes or wherever he ends up, if it's here, I I I hope he's able to return stronger than ever. The thing that's so crazy about it is he's only 25 years old and he turns 26 in, I believe, October, as I have in front of me. Yeah, October. So if he can find a way to just get right within the next year, year and a half, I I would love to, to see it because the game is at a disservice without him. And for a kid who came into the league with so much pressure on him because of his father and I love LeVar Ball, but, you know, he he hyped him up. And mm-hmm. I understand, you know, any any father that has put in the work with their kids and watched their kids put in the work, I feel like they they have that right in, in, in empowering their kids. But, man, I, I think he was really just getting started on making LeVar look like the smartest man in the room. I really, I really do, but it's it's really unfortunate. Yeah, man, and not just LeVar Ball being the smartest in the room, Magic Johnson, too. Because Magic Johnson took the gamble on drafting Lonzo Ball, knowing you already had D'Angelo Russell at point guard. And Lonzo Ball, you can argue, especially with the development of D'Angelo Russell this past year or, or, or leading up to now, Lonzo might have been the better option if he was still healthy. And um, if he would have worked well with the Bulls, obviously would have changed the trajectory of where we were going. Um, and that's just not the reality. I don't, and I do think he has, he, I think this is the last Alonzo ball. If the bulls are smart because the bulls are now feeling the pressure from everybody knowing that you, you can't accept the mediocrity you've been playing the past year and some change. Now you have to go, you have to make changes. You have to be aggressive and creating and getting this point guard situation resolved. Um, and you can't wait for Lonzo Ball, Lonzo Ball to come back through that door, especially now that you are already supposedly thinking privately he ain't going to come back. That should be your trigger right there. Even the second surgery should be your trigger. They're like, okay, we need to get somebody in here because it's not a guarantee. Bulls already have a bad history with knees. They're gross. <laughs> like, he already have a bad history with knees. And what makes it worse is Lonzo Ball is 6'7". Six, 6'7 seven. Six, seven with knees at a guard position, that's not ideal. Look at Sean Livingston. So um, he can come back like Sean Livingston did and change his whole career, be in the right situation and win. But at the same time, you know, the Bulls got to put themselves in the best position to do what's best for them to win right now. When you got a Derek, when you got uh, DeMar DeRozan, Zach Levine and, and and it looks like resigning Vucevic at the at the at the forefront. So Bulls got some tough decisions to make. And it's unfortunate that this report comes out in the midst of them trying to figure out what the direction is going to look like. For sure. And, and speaking of tough decisions to make, I gotta ask you, man, as we open up this fact or fiction segment a game in which we'll explore whether or not we're buying the top rumors that are surfacing around the league as of the moment. Starting with, there's been general skepticism that Zach Levine will finish out his current contract as a member of the Chicago Bulls. Are you saying fact on that? Or are you saying fiction? Fact. Um, from what I've heard, the Bulls were never really married or tied to Zach um, in the beginning stages. Zach came out, had the heck of an all-star year with Lonzo Ball there. And the Bulls were like, okay, well, since he's an all, he's, you know, he's all-star now, he's showing that he's improving. We can work with this. But for the right offer, I think Zach Levine's name will be willing to be put on the table. Um, and Zach Levine has been in trade rumors. Even this past off, even during this past season, um, so um, I know Zach's not a fan of that. He wants to be here long term, but Arturis Carnesis is known for making the moves when he needs to strike. 
no matter who it is. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm buying the fact that Zach Levine isn't completely off the grid or, 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 or dismissed from trade talks or trade rumors. I think the Bulls, especially now with the Bulls not having really a choice if they want to retool this roster and make it a winning roster. You got to do what you got to do to put yourself in the best position to win. And right now, you're not winning with Zach Levine, and you're not winning with DeMar DeRozan and Nikola Vucevic at the front. So you got to make choices, and that means evaluating everything, which the Bulls said this offseason they, off they will do. I think Zach is at the forefront of that. I got to agree with you on it, bro. I, I'm, I'm calling facts. And I get the skepticism. He signed a five-year, $215.2 million max deal last summer. The final season is a player option valued at $49.9 million in 26-27, as I have in front of me. So this means that he could become a free agent again within the next three years during the summer of 2026. Now, while they haven't shopped him like widely at this stage, I don't think anybody on this roster is entitled to feel safe, really, when you when you really think about it. And, yeah, Vucevic is an unrestricted free agent who they in talks with and trying to negotiate a new deal with him. But De- DeMar DeRozan is entering the final year of his contract. Mm-hmm. Kobe White can walk away if the team doesn't match an offer sheet from him this uh, for him this summer. And with Lonzo, as we discussed, possibly missing all the next year, as well as is you know, future time following his third knee surgery. Yeah, they could easily shop Levine. They could shop DeMar too. They could shop everybody. You know, like this is a team that just had their first round pick conveyed to the Orlando Magic. And that's why Josh has been talking about it a lot on his Bulldogs podcast with Drew, which you can check out on the Bigs Media. Like why losing out on that was so huge because now you don't even have a piece that you can look forward to building with in the future. So yeah, I, I, I could definitely see Zach Levine getting traded and not finishing out his current deal with the Bulls because of the current state in which the Bulls franchise is in and the possible state that they could be in if they don't perform up to expectation starting in the early going of next year. So yeah, I, I could definitely see that. And not to mention, too, real real briefly, who says that the Bulls signing Vucevic is going to mean that he's coming back to Chicago? You have no capital. You have you got rid of everything for this guy. You might be trying to look to sign and trade this dude to get back something in return because you're about to let him walk if he don't sign. You got to find a way to, to replenish what you lost, which is literally – multiple draft picks and lack of experience of going past the first round of an NBA playoff. You got to do something. And if, if you think Vooch is the answer, that means you got to build around that. But if you don't think he's the answer, I wouldn't be surprised if they signed and traded him. So that way they can get something back in return to try to, and to replenish what they lost, which was a lot for him. And if they don't sign and trade for him, you could best believe that they're going to get some calls about DeMar DeRozan because it's a lot of teams that got knocked out early in these playoffs that are in need of a veteran wing of his caliber in spite of the fact that he plays a game that most GMs that value the analytical realm of things more higher than others, they may say that it's a little bit archaic, but I think most are starting to come around to the fact that when it's the postseason and the game is predicated in the half court, you need a guy like DeMar DeRozan. So mm-hmm. they got pieces that they could trade and, and seek to go about bringing about rather a rebuild if need be. They, they, they have those pieces. They definitely do. But I want to move on to the next topic involving the Dallas Mavericks, who are reportedly not interested in D'Angelo Russell on a with a in a sign and trade deal. Are you calling fact on that? Or are you calling fiction? I'm calling fiction on this, and this is why. You don't get you don't get Kyrie Irving to come back. What else are you gonna get? <laughs> if you don't get Kyrie, you you gotta get something to return if you're not gonna get Kyrie back. That's just a given. 
And if I'm Dallas, I would look to get someone like a D'Angelo Russell because he can play off the ball. Yeah, he needs some groin to do, but put him next to Luka Doncic. You don't have to rely on him so much like the Lakers did. Um, and quite frankly, if I'm the Lakers, there will be no reason to resign D'Angelo Russell. That chance is gone. Just off the playoffs alone. You, you can't trust in D'Angelo Russell right now for a long-term deal. So why not ship him to Dallas, which he could actually fill a void that in some cases Jalen Brunson was filling. I'm not saying he's going to do it to that level, but there are some similarities in the game. If they are, if they both play, if you compare it to, there are some similarities. Why not fill that void of what you first, of, of your first love that you lost? And he's not a bad fit for that. I think that could actually be a pretty decent fit for him. And it opens the door for Kyrie to go to LA, which is honestly probably his best move. Um, so yeah, I, I would call fiction on that if I'm Mark Cuban. You can say in public, I don't want him. But behind the scenes, you peeping the situation out. Yeah, I, I call fiction on this too, bro. I don't think they can rule out anything because no one knows what Kyrie Irving wants to do in free agency. However, if he wants to go to the Lakers, are you going to allow him to walk to the L.A. Lakers for nothing in return? after you just let Jalen Brunson go a summer ago, mm -hmm. after you let Steve Nash walk over almost 20 years ago now, after you let Tyson Chandler go and walk away from you after winning a championship in 2011, which was 12 years ago, mm -hmm. it shows that you haven't learned from your mistakes if you do let Kyrie just walk for nothing. That's what it shows me. I understand maybe him not being your first option. I bet you Dallas would rather have DeAndre Ayton in a sign and trade deal than D'Angelo Russell, even though they know that they are in need of a guard that can spot Luka from having such a high usage rate and the need to have a ball all the time, which Kyrie can do, but if he leaves and they get nothing, then that, that problem comes back to the forefront again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they, 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 they can't, they just can't rule that out, bro. They can't. I get it. You know, D'Angelo Russell, he didn't really help his value in these playoffs with his lack of defensive intensity and his inability to shoot the three ball consistently and, and, make plays in a pick and roll game, which is what we've known him to do when he's playing at a high level. But you can't rule that out because you got to leave with something if you are the Dallas Mavericks, especially after the way in which your season ended this past year. You got the number 10 overall pick. You could probably get an immediate contributor, but that pick is going to be a rookie trying to learn the rigors of the league. You're going to have to get somebody with a vet and someone that's been there and done that to at least make the most out of what you can with this Luka Doncic era down in Dallas. But I, I want to move on and talk about the Portland Trailblazers. There's been reports that they've been, that they're willing rather to trade the number three pick for an all-star level player. Are you calling fact on this? Or are you calling fiction? I'm calling fact. Damon Lillard don't want to play with no rookies. I'm just being honest with you. You don't think so? I do not think so. It, was reported, it, it was reported today that he was watching, I believe, Amen Thompson's workout yeah. with the Portland Trail, Trail Blazers. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, let's put it this way. I won't be surprised if they're doing their due diligence. Any team's going to do their due diligence. That's true. Um, but when I, when I tell you I went to the combine and came back from the combine with the same thing, that's, that, that's, that's what I was hearing at the combine. That, that Portland's really willing to trade that pick. And, you know, D Damian Lillard has made it known to them 
and made it onto the public. I prefer not to play with the rookie. I just don't. He wants to play with top tier talent, which he should. He's an all star, so, and and the face of the franchise. He should. So, what I've heard, there's three options they want to look at: Mikael Bridges, Pascal Siakam, and Jalen Brown. With my, with Mikael Bridges being number one, because they're boys, and they've trained together, they have a rapport together. People got it twisted when Damian Lillard went to the Brooklyn Nets game in the playoffs thinking, oh, my gosh, Mikel's trying to recruit Dame Lillard. Nah, bro. It's the other way around. Um, And I do believe that now that they know they got this third pick, I don't know if Sean Marks will pull the trigger. But it's going to be very enticing to look at that and say, you know what, with that third pick, I could replace the Cole Bridges with Brandon Miller. Not a bad look. So with that being said, Oh, yeah. Portland Trailblazers is definitely looking to see what they can get for that third pick. I'm, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be ideally maybe a three or four team trade to make all this possible to get what maybe they whomever they want. But Damien's telling them people, do your due diligence in case you can't make anything work, but don't get it twisted. Number one priority, I need one of these three guys here. I'm going to say fact. I know Portland's not going to seek to settle with Damian Lillard still intact, and that's one thing that they can't afford to do. But to say that you are all in when it comes to building around Lillard and trading arguably one of the highest draft picks in the history of your franchise, it like this could either be this could either go really good or it could go really horrible yeah and they better make sure that that star that they're getting is a bona fide star i wondered why dane was in brooklyn during the first round of the playoffs of the Sixers next series i won't lie but i didn't think it was him being there because he wanted to go to brooklyn i didn't think that had anything to do with it i i did think it was a motive but i couldn't like process that at the time now that I've been hearing these reports, some of the same in which you've been talking about the last couple of weeks in our open run as well, I get it. I could see Macau Bridges being a possibility. Do I, if I, would I trade him if I was Sean Marks? Hell no, I wouldn't right. trade him. I wouldn't trade him. And yeah, you could think about the possibility of getting Brandon Miller, but you don't know what the Charlotte Hornets is going to do in number two. That's true. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a lot of what ifs right there. But, yeah, I, I think they're going to keep trying to build around Damian Lillard, but they need to get a really good return for this pick or just keep it if they can't. Because if you trade the number three overall pick for someone like, let's say, John Collins, no disrespect, that's not a move that's going to just make me say, okay, I got to keep my eye on Portland because mm -hmm. they just got John Collins. And then, mind you, you, whoever this star is, you better make sure that they're locked up for a long period of time because you still got to find a way to pay Jeremy Grant. So, that, that, you know, it's, that's, it's a lot riding on that. But want to go on away from Portland to New York where the Knicks have Josh Hart, who will be set to hit the market this summer as an unrestricted free agent. There's been reports that he's thinking about garnering $18 million per year on a new deal. If you were a general manager of a franchise in the midst of contention for the NBA playoffs or trying to make that next step, would you be willing to give Josh Hart $18 million a year on a, on, a new deal, on a new deal? You think that's fact that's being reported? You think that's fiction? I think it's fact that it's being reported that this is what he's seeking. Okay. But if I was a GM, I wouldn't give him 18 million. Okay. I wouldn't give him 18 million. But for the Knicks, I think they have no choice. Because the roster is already so uh depleted as is. You're not it's gonna be hard to find someone to fill in that type of void with the makeup of the roster they have now. And there's no guarantee that you're gonna trade Julius Randle 
or anyone or get or bring in anybody else. Um, so if that's the case, you might have to break the bank a little bit to keep jo- to keep Josh Hart. And I think the Knicks will be willing to do it, considering that he would be paid su- uh, such dividends for the Knicks during their playoff and their postseason run, especially the second half of the season when he, when they traded for him. I, I think they would break the bank for him. And I think Jalen Brunson would vouch for it um, for sure. But if I'm a GM, am I giving him 18 mil? No. No, I'm not. <laughs> I think in this NBA economy, man, he got an argument for it. I, I think it's fact that that's what he's seeking. And he may never be an all-star, but when I look at guys like, no disrespect, Joe Harris. Yeah. Making three million more. Why Josh Hart can't get it? Why Josh Hart can't get 72 mil for, for, for four years, man? He in the prime of his career. He put up 10, 7, 3, and, and 1 off the bench, you know, for, for a Knicks team. Don't really turn the ball over. Shot the ball over 50% from the floor and over 50% from three. Plays excellent defense. Defense, might I add, that could be very vital on a championship contender. Because, like, mm-hmm. we look at a guy like Bruce Brown right now in the NBA Finals. Yeah. Josh Hart could easily be one of them guys in the next couple years. Yeah. He that good. And I think he's more versatile defensively than Bruce Brown is. I think he can offer a team a lot more offensively than Bruce Brown can. No, no disrespect to Bruce Brown. Mm-hmm. And I think the Knicks defense went to another level with Josh Hart. Yeah, I, I think if they, if they could give him that deal, that might that would be a quality move from Leon Rose in World Wide West in the Knicks front office, man, because he could either be a guy that you slot in as a starter or coming off the bench. And like you said, Jalen Brunson is his guy. They go back to their days in college, competing for national titles at Villanova, to now being on the NBA stage with one another. I think this is where he wants to be, and I think it might be where he needs to be for a Knicks team that's trying to build a very strong culture and is actually doing things the right way, regardless of what some people might have thought, you know, what they pursued of Donovan Mitchell, because they would have had to give up a lot of them young core players in order to get them. No, that's that's very true, and when you compare it to the people that you did, like a Josh Harris, you know, or like a Duncan Robinson or something like that, like that yeah. makes that 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 makes sense, but even that precedent is high. Because, what? you know, Josh Harris, he ain't even playing and really playing out that contract. Since he came back from those injuries, he ain't yeah, been Joe, the same. Yeah. He, 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 he's, he's been broke. And Duncan Robinson just had a chance to revive himself because you're talking about someone who literally throughout the entire season was benched and didn't only and then had to come into the playoffs and catch fire, in which he did. So because of those scenarios and putting Josh Hart in that same category – I mean, he's not the best. He's not a shooter like Josh Harris or Duncan Robinson. He does more things on the other end for sure. But yeah, it's 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 a real fine line for me with that. And I'm not saying it's impossible. If Josh Hart can get that bread, by all means, go get it. I know the Knicks will probably do what they can to give it to him, um, or any team will probably give it to him in today's economy, like you said. But that's that's a fine line because when you compare it to those guys who have their ups and downs and living up to that contract. Yeah, but I, I'm going to carry on. This is the last topic as part of our fact or fiction segment. Been reports that the Raptors are not sure as to whether or not they'll be buyers or sellers this offseason. Are you calling fact on that or fiction? Fiction. They selling like a mug. They're going to be selling. <laughs> they selling like hotcakes. Um, Because it's a new era. No Nick Nurse. There's the question marks with my senior uh, Nassai Mijuri about how long he's going to be there and if he might want him to go somewhere else. And I think they used, like we talked about earlier in the, earlier, uh, in the, in the NBA season, they used the trade deadline to see what, type, what, 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 the, what the market is for those guys now. They have a set standard of what to go for. So when they revisit these conversations for guys like Gary Trent Jr., Pascal Siakam, OG Anuabi, you know, you can you know what the standard is for their market. They're going to exploit that this offseason. And I think a lot of it does depend on the coach they bring in as well. They don't have a head coach right now. So depending on which head coach they bring, 
it's going to determine whether they're going to, you know, they're going to buy in or they're going to sell. But my initial point right now, yeah, they're selling. And they're, and they use this season to figure out what that market is going to look like. So when the off season comes, all right, bet y'all willing to spend? All right, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. We'll, we'll, we'll revisit this again and make sure what you offered in the, in the, in the regular season is either, is either the same or better offers this go around. But they selling them things. They selling them things. Yeah, and, and they've been on a head coaching search unlike any other because they've been interviewing some interesting names. J.J. Reddick even got an interview with the – I don't want to get started with that, bro. On, on, no, on the, top of Steve Nash. No, no, I, no. I, could, I could get Steve Nash getting an interview with him being the face of Canadian basketball for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Had a few good years with the with the Nets, despite getting fired early on this season. And maybe getting a fresh start in Toronto with a front office that backs him. That could be what he needs to prove his skills as a head coach in the league. Mm -hmm. But I'm calling fiction on that as well. Now, I don't know if they – selling or not they might not want to share their plans fully but they've had more than enough time to make a decision within the confines of their organization to know what they're gonna do and yeah i do believe that the lack of moves that they made last year during the trade deadline mm -hmm. was a way for them to gauge the market to see how much a guy like a og anunobi could be worth if they wanted to put him up there on the market. They can't, they also can't control what these players on the free agency market are going to do, such as Jakob Podol, Gary Trent Jr. and Fred Van Vliet. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, if they, if they did sell, I wouldn't be shocked. And if they sought the buy, I wouldn't be surprised either. But I do think a lot of that depends on what you alluded to, who's going to be the head coach down the road as their head coach and search reportedly is set to come to a close soon. And maybe by next week, we might be talking about an open run. Who the Raptors have hired as a head coach? <laughs> You're right. You're right. I'm looking. I'm. In, I'm going to be interested to see who the person is going to be. Real quick, bro. As we had the closing moments of open run this week, what are what's what are some things that you're looking forward to seeing in the NBA Finals with Game One set to tip off this Thursday, 7:30 Central Time on ABC? What What are you looking forward to seeing between Denver and Miami? I want to see how Bam shows up. Uh, Bam's going to have a tough assignment on him regarding the, regarding the Joker, man. And uh, I'm not saying he's going to have to completely stop him, but they got Miami got to find a way to slow them down, which leads me to my second point. And I'm going to look after him. How often are they going to play this 2-3 zone and how soon is Denver going to break it? Because that may be the difference between a sweep and at least six games. Um, especially if you're talking about Miami flourishing the way that they can flourish, not just on the road, but at home as well. So those are the things I'm definitely going to look forward, look forward to to see if it's going to make or break this series, which I believe it can. Who you, who you think going to take it? I, my heart says Miami, but my mind says Denver. My okay. mind says Denver. Denver has too much firepower. <laughs> he just got too much firepower um for them to deal with and if you talking about michael porter jr and aaron gordon and jamal murray showing up in the way that they did in this last series and have been throughout the playoffs i don't think miami has enough reinforcements to slow them down you know i i get i get the denver pick i get it i'm i, 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 well, well, yeah, well, I, I, I had to make a it. bet though i had to make a bet oh, that's what i'm saying buckets. that's what i'm saying and that's and that's what that, you just took the words out my mouth that's and I, I I feel like it's time to go gambling. Mm -hmm. These NBA playoffs, all the wild stuff we done seen. I want to go gambling. I, I think Miami winning this is six games. I do, and I am eager to see how this two three zone is going to be attacked on Denver side of things. Because if they think that they can just beat this by shooting over the top, and them shots not falling. This series will come so much more interesting, man. And I am, I, I'm really looking forward to that Bam and Jokic matchup too. I know a lot of people thought the AD and Jokic matchup would be something, but this is a perfect opportunity for Bam Adebayo to show the country just how impactful 
of a defender he truly is. I don't think a lot mm-hmm. of people really know, unless if you really watch basketball on a night-to-night basis, just how important Bam Adebayo is to Miami's defense. I do think Denver has the edge in the interior. I think that they're going to have some games where they out-rebound Miami, and they're going to really make them work extremely hard to stay in games. But it's going to be a fun series. But I, I think Miami's going to win in six. I hope so. I just wish I was in Miami. You know how wonderful it is to be watching Miami basketball in June on the beach? Oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> marvelous. I wish like, I wish we had that exposure. <laughs> I feel you, bro, because that that definitely is a hell of a venue to to check out for a finals game. But that concludes this week's edition of Open Run. I want to take this time to thank all of those who have taken out the time to listen to me and Josh talk about all of the latest news and headlines that helped shape the week that was across the world of basketball and more. Make sure to check War Media's YouTube channel out as well for the latest episode of the at bat podcast hosted by the versatile Saul rodriguez and miles porter talking on all the latest happenings across the diamond here with the teams on the north and south side of chicago as well as other hot topics around the mlb including our new war media colleague and wnba insider stephanie stephanie excuse me shrimp pluskies latest piece over at war media Substack page breaking down how the sky's defense has helped to fuel their winning ways as of late and james jefferson's article also highlighting the top landing spots for five-time pro bowl wide receiver deandre hopkins who is on the free agency market for the first time in his career after being released onto the open market prior to the conclusion of last week by the arizona cardinals for myself gabriel wilkins and my co-host josh hicks so long everybody